I'm just going to take a moment of indulgence since I have the microphone. I just want to let everyone know how proud we are of the work of Senator Jeff Merkley and Representative Susan Bonamici for introducing the Allen Reinstein Ban Asbestos um, Act. I have their letters um, congratulating ADAO on this 17th con conference. Um, as some of you know, Linda's husband and Emily's dad, Ellen Reinstein, was diagnosed with mesothelioma in 2003, and he died in 2006. He saw the founding of the organization. Um, and from what, whatever wonderful place he is right now, I know he is proud of all the work that ADO has done. I want to thank um, our members of Congress for supporting the law to ban asbestos. And as Senator Merkley said in the letter, there is simply no level of exposure to asbestos that's safe and that the import and use of asbestos here in America is unacceptable. Um, Representative Bonamici called it unconscionable that asbestos is still legal in the U.S. and that they both will continue to fight in Congress to ban the importation, manufacture, and distribution of asbestos. So we thank them for their leadership. Um, it is my privilege to introduce our speaker for the Andrew Schneider Memorial Lecture. Do we have an introduction by uh, Kathy Best? Um, I had the honor of meeting Andrew Schneider. I was actually an employee at the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration. It was after the work day was done. I was still there working with the Assistant Secretary that evening, and the phone rang after hours. I picked it up, and he said, this is Andrew Schneider. I'm a reporter. And I want to know why your agency didn't do anything to protect people in Libby, Montana from vermiculite and the asbestos that was in there. And from there, I learned the whole um, tragic tale of Libby, Montana. And we heard from Dr. Black how that has continued to this day, not just in Libby, but throughout the country where all of those millions of tons of asbestos-contaminated vermiculite were contained. Um, I also noted that Laura, one of our speakers earlier, standing with Dr. Black, was holding up a copy of Andrew Schneider's book. It shows what kind of impact it continues to make. Um, so it is my privilege to introduce uh, Kathy Best, who is Andrew Schneider's wife, and she will um, take us into this part of the program. And at the at um, the when we are finished with the presentation, we will have an opportunity for questions. Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Best, and I'm thrilled to introduce David Borax, the speaker for this year's Andrew Schneider Memorial Lecture. As you know, Linda Reinstein created this lecture to honor my late husband Andy and the work he did covering asbestos contamination that began in Libby, Montana, and spread across the United States, expo exposing thousands to deadly tremolite fibers. Andy could not have done that reporting without many of the people in this room who shared their expertise with him. That gift of time and talent helped him write better, deeper stories. So this lecture also honors you, and I hope, will encourage you to continue to work with reporters to help them write accurate, in-depth stories about the dangers of asbestos. David's work is an outstanding example of smart, thorough, and important reporting. He produced an hour-long podcast called Asbestos Town for WFAE in North Carolina. It won Best Radio Documentary of 2021 from the Society of Professional Journalists he told the story of the lasting legacy of Carolina asbestos on Davidson, North Carolina. He interviewed former workers, homeowners, environmental officials, politicians, and developers. You'll recognize many of the themes, environmental justice, the fear of some residents to work with EPA to test their property, 
the tension between those who want to develop a former asbestos plant and those who fear that doing so will just spread the contamination farther. Before joining WFAE, David worked as a reporter and editor for the Charlotte Observer, American Banker, the China News in Taipei, and the Hartford Current, among others. He covers climate change for, the, uh, for WFAE, but previously reported on housing and homelessness, energy and the environment, transportation, and business. David has a bachelor's degree in history from Cornell University and a master's degree from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Congratulations, David. I'm eager to hear from you. And I'm so thrilled that you're giving this year's Andrew Schneider Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. I really appreciate that. Thanks to Linda Reinstein and the Asbestos Disease Awareness Organization for inviting me to give this year's Andrew Schneider Lecture. I didn't know Andrew Schneider, uh, but I know his work. As I was researching Asbestos Town, I read his reporting about another asbestos town, Libby, Montana. And if you're not familiar with it, Libby was the site of a vermiculite mine. Uh, the asbestos contaminated the town, causing deadly cancer and other asbestos-related diseases. Hundreds of people died, many more were made sick. His reporting turned into a 2004 book and led to lawsuits and EPA action. In a 2009 interview, he said he first heard about Libby at a CDC conference. A doctor told him about this small town in Montana where people had been dying. Later on, on an unrelated trip to Montana, he and colleagues decided to go check it out. They uncovered what became a global scandal. My own project also began when I was reporting on an unrelated story. More about that in a minute, but first uh, I want to talk about Davidson. Davidson, North Carolina hasn't made the same kind of national headlines as Libby, but it is one of what we now know are a long list of asbestos towns. Places like Libby, Montana and Ambler, Pennsylvania, where asbestos was mined or manufactured into consumer and commercial products. In all of those towns, the story is the same. An industrial operation sickens people, companies deny wrongdoing and fight regulation, and it takes an outcry and maybe some press coverage to get action. Because the asbestos is still here, it's also a story of what Linda Reinstein calls legacy asbestos. And in many cases, it's an environmental justice story, one that can't be told without talking about economic power powerlessness and racism. These operations were often built in low-income communities and communities of color. So let me tell you about Davidson. It's a small town of about 15,000 people north of Charlotte. At one time, the only t thing in town was Davidson College. It's what was founded before the town. Davidson is a small Presbyterian liberal arts college, uh, recently made famous because of its most recent graduate, NBA star Stephen Curry. Here's our, our main street. Uh, it has a tiny downtown with just one main street. Uh, only one side of the street has shops and offices on it. The other side is the Village Green. Uh, the railroad tracks run through the center of town like so many uh, southern towns. On the east side of the tracks, which would be to the left here, uh, is the downtown and the white side of town. On the west side is a historically African-American neighborhood, which we just refer to as the west side. This is an important part of the story that I'll get to in just a bit. So right next to those railroad tracks on the west side is an old brick mill. It's now painted gray. It was built in 1891 as the Linden Cotton Mill. I'm sure you know that old brick factories these days are in high demand because uh, they're being renovated into shops, restaurants, offices, apartments. They're really hot. It's very cool if your town has one of these. This one in Davidson first caught the attention of developers about 15 years ago. Uh, at, at that time and continuing to now, to, to now, this old mill was being used primarily as a warehouse. A potential developer from Raleigh, North Carolina, was considering redeveloping it. So one night in 2008, Davidson's planning director and the developer led officials and residents on a tour of the five-acre site. They talked about plans for a commuter rail station, retail stores, residence, residences, and offices. I was on that tour, and it was the first time that I heard that the mill had once been an asbestos factory, even though I had lived in town for 15 years. And I wasn't the only one just hearing about it. 
Uh, the town's African-American commu community was a different story, though. They were all too familiar with the fact that this had once been an asbestos mill and that there was asbestos here. So the African-American residents who live on the west side of town said they were worried that asbestos buried on the site would be disrupted by any new development. They talked about runoff from the site and neighborhood health problems that they said were related to the old factory. I've been covering this story ever since then. That Raleigh developer pretty soon backed away and others came and went over the years as well, all of them really stymied by the asbestos contamination. How could they make money redeveloping a mill if it required a multi-million dollar cleanup? At that time, I was publishing a local news website in Davidson called davidsonnews.net. It was a community daily newspaper on the web, something that most small towns uh, don't have. I wrote regularly about the mill and asbestos contamination that was discovered at homes and public spaces around Davidson's west side. I shut down davidsonnews.net in 2015. Uh, there's a long story I could tell there about sustainability of local news and the willingness of people to pay for it, which is not willing. Uh, the following year, I became an environmental reporter at WFAE, the public radio station in Charlotte. And I was allowed there to continue following the asbestos story. In 2020, my editor, Greg Collard, agreed to let me pursue a larger project about the mill. I had been doing sort of the daily, up, the regular updates every once in a while about any new uh, projects that were looking at the place, that sort of thing. But I had long wanted to take all of my reporting over the years and translate it into something that was really capturing the whole story. And that's where Asbestos Town came from. For several months in and around other assignments, I dug into the mill's history. I interviewed current and former residents and town officials. I went to public meetings and I talked to the EPA and state environmental officials. I wanna share a bit of the history that I uncovered with some of the voices. When the Linden Mill was built in 1891, it was the first of a couple in town during that era it became a major employer, for white folks anyway, according to the town historian Jan Blodgett. This is an aerial photo from uh, probably the 1950s or 60s that shows you the mill complex as it looked at that time. And uh, for, for reference as we talk about this, uh, the area to the left side of the mill, uh, kind of behind it there, which looks like a, an open pit, is where workers would uh, dump the asbestos weight, waste. Around the mill, as you can see there, are uh, mill houses where the workers lived. Um, and uh, this gives you a kind of a little bit of a broader view. In the foreground here is Main Street. You can see that row of old buildings, many of which still stand. Uh, there's the Davidson College Presbyterian uh, Church uh, at the lower right there. And uh, kind of just north of the mill there, uh, you see another steeple. That's the Davidson Presbyterian Church, which was the African-American church. Uh, to the right, that open lot there is the baseball field where the African-American community played regularly. So Jan Blodgett, the historian, uh, told me that hiring practice, practices changed in the 1930s when Carolina Asbestos Company took over this mill. Black workers were given an opportunity uh, to work in a way that they had not before. Up until that time, really the best job that they could get in ta town was as a maintenance worker at the college. So the Carolina Asbestos uh, Company made a variety of different asbestos products. Probably some of the best known were the shingles that they made, which were colored shingles. You could put these on the outside of your house. Um, and this uh, photo of the box uh, comes from Tony Rich, who's here with us at the conference this weekend. Uh, and he has a huge collection of these things. And I was really excited when I found this online. It's the only thing I've been able to find that is any remnant of the kind of business that the Carolina Asbestos did. So the company made insulating fabric, colorful building shingles, automotive brake linings, and many other things. Generations of area residents found work there. And uh, a little bit of a close up on their logo and their slogan, nothing could be finer, right? We now know, of course, how wrong that was. And I'm gonna introduce you to some of the people that I interviewed for this. I interviewed Frank Jordan. He was 19 years old when he got hired. Here's a short segment from the Asbestos Town documentary where he talks about his work at the mill. Well, I first start off being a supplier to the machine. Like you, you go out at a stock room out there to make the asbestos. 
and we go out into the stock room and bring the stuff into the machinery. And you would feed the hoppers back there on the back. But I worked myself up to be a lead man. It was a good job that Jordan enjoyed, but it came with health risks, he says, workers didn't really understand. When I first started, it was so dusty in there that you couldn't see each other 10 foot apart. Uh-huh. That's how much dust I had going on in there. Did you guys know what the dust was? Oh, yeah. Well, we knew, but at that time, I didn't know what that poison to your system. I, I worked on first shift in there uh, from 7 to 3.30. And when you leave out there in the afternoon, it looked like snow outside. Even in the churchyard, it was covered. That stuff come all the way uptown on the streets up there. But when you walk out of there in the afternoon, the ground just plumb covered. Stories like that about the time when people worked in the mill, they just really hit you in the heart when you think about the working conditions and the fact that uh, you know, the workers had no protection. So the mill actually was forced to put in uh, some air handling equipment that improved it somewhat, but it finally closed down in 1970. Uh, Frank Jordan is now in his 70s, and he has a successful limousine and shuttle business, and he's a leader on the west side of Davidson. Uh, but most of his coworkers weren't so lucky. He says many died of asbestos-related diseases. Yeah, quite a few of them, uh, and you want me to be honest with you? All of them gone that worked in the plant during the same time I was in there. They all gone on. And the majority of them died with the asbestos. So this is give you a little bit of a sense of uh, the layout of the West Side neighborhood. Uh, the red area, obviously, is the former Carolina asbestos plant. The railroad tracks run just to the right of it there uh, from kind of north to south and uh, everything else there gives you an idea. Most of the residences on the west side are, uh, you can see the mill from there. Um, it really, it took decades for environmental and health laws to catch up to the dangers of asbestos here. Uh, eventually, state health officials forced Carolina asbestos to install ventilation and, you know, as Linda often reminds us, the laws still fall short. And uh, even long after this mill has closed, there's still problems with it. So I talked to other residents uh, who lost family members to asbestos disease, fathers or brothers who worked in the mill, spouses, neighbors who came in contact with the asbestos. And as we all know, you don't have to have been directly working with asbestos to be affected by it. I heard stories about people who uh, did the laundry of their family members who worked in the mill uh, and had problems later on. Uh, it wasn't just a hazard in the mill. It was also a problem in the neighborhood. And that's another fascinating and horrifying part of this story. As Frank Jordan told us, clouds of asbestos dust drifted out into the neighborhood and onto streets and yards. Waste asbestos buried in the mill yard also ran off into the street and a nearby stream. So this is the back side of the mill, and it's what the neighbors call Asbestos Hill or Mystery Hill. And I first heard this at a community organizing meeting where the neighbors are trying to figure out what they thought about a, uh, a development that was proposed for it many years ago. Uh, years after asbestos manufacturing stopped, kids played in and around the old factory there um, and in the asbestos. I talked to a former neighborhood resident named Vince Huntley, who remembers getting getting covered with white powder after playing in the abandoned mill and going home to his house. He also played on the mound behind the buildings that residents called Asbestos Hill or Mystery Hill. And we would get these boxes and we would get on the hill and we would slide, we would run, and we would just slide down that hill right there into the road, man, every day. I can't help but think about the number of kids my age that grew up with asthma that live right there close to that place. So there's lots of stories like that. Um, in 1973, a man named Robert Kenyon from Charlotte bought the mill as a real estate His children who inherited the mill say that he never knew about the asbestos. Uh, it wasn't disclosed, he says, and since he wasn't from Davidson, he had none of the community knowledge about it, which he could have gotten by talking to any of the neighbors. In 1984, a mother complained to the health department about her children coming home covered in asbestos. 
Uh, one of the things I uncovered in my research was the letter to the health department from the woman who was complaining about it and asking what they were gonna do. What happened was that officials ordered the mill's owner to cover the asbestos, which he did. And again, 1984, we knew well about asbestos. There were some best practices. Uh, they covered it with a, a foot of soil, I think is what they ended up doing. The house, uh, this house is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, this is Robert Kenyon, what Robert Kenyon bought. It's been a warehouse pretty much ever since he bought it. Um, one of the saddest parts of this story is all the asbestos brought to the West Side neighborhood on purpose for use as fill in yards and driveways. This is a house uh, from about three years ago, temporarily uh, covered up with plastic and pebbles in an area that was found to have asbestos. This was part of their yard and their driveway. Um, residents for decades knew that uh, if you wanted, you could pull your pickup truck uh, up to that big waste pile behind the mill, uh, fill it up with waste asbestos and take it home and uh, put it in your yard as fill, put it on the driveway, um, whatever you wanted to do. So uh, there were yards all over the neighborhood and in other parts of town that had asbestos just beneath the grass or even uh, open on the, on the driveways. Here's West Side neighborhood leader Marvin Brandon and let's play the clip from that. They could go over and get the asbestos, put it in the trunk of their car, bring it home, spread it out of the driveway and crush it up, just break it up or drive over it to break it up because I remember my dad doing it several times. And Marvin Brandon is one of the many people I talked to whose father died of an asbestos-related disease. So over the years, residents of the West Side neighborhood continued to worry about the asbestos once many of them were seeing themselves and their neighbors get sick. They were uh, learning about asbestos in new ways. Uh, but as I say in the Asbestos Town documentary, uh, permanently dealing with the asbestos there wasn't on anyone's agenda. Not the owners, not the town, not state or federal environmental officials. And I, I wanna stop here and say that there's really no formal accounting of asbestos disease in Davidson. Uh, there's just the stories of the community. Uh, you know, there was a, a attempts over the years to file lawsuits, both when the mill was active and afterwards, but nothing ever came to any of those. Uh, there was one guy who held bake sales to raise money for a lawsuit that he was never able to file. So around the time that I joined WFAE in 2016, uh, yet another developer was considering, re considering redeveloping the old factory, and at a public meeting introducing the proposal, plant neighbors didn't want to talk about the development. They wanted to talk about the white material that they saw running down the hill off of that mound behind the old mill where the workers used to toss waste asbestos. And it was visible on the street, you could see it. And uh, as I said, the residents' concerns weren't new, but at, the, at that moment, uh, the evidence was in plain sight. Uh, town officials were moved to action by that. Um, they brought in both the State Department of Environmental Quality and the EPA. So uh, this is the backside of the mill. You know, over the years, that pit of asbestos grew into a large mound. Uh, it grew up with trees, and this is true in so many places where asbestos is found. You know, we don't even know it's there. Um, right in the middle of that photograph, there's a white area, a sort of a lighter colored area, and you can see uh, this is a, a groundhog burrow. So uh, groundhogs were living in the side of this hill. They dug into it, and what did they pull out? They pulled out asbestos waste. Uh, you can see it a little bit closer here, and you can actually see it. And I took these pictures in 2017. I was able to walk by there. That's why they had those signs there saying, stay away from it. Um, but uh, the mill owner was forced at that time to install a new cap, and this time it was a plastic liner. Uh, first of all, they cleared the hill of all the vegetation they put a plastic liner, another foot of soil, and they put grass on top of it. Residents told town officials about the asbestos in their yards as well, and that triggered another investigation and eventually two separate EPA Superfund cleanups. And that's what the hill looks like today. So more than 100 properties were tested in 2017 and again in 2021. And this was not an at-home do-it-yourself operation, it was a licensed EPA operation with contractors, uh, and they were out there for weeks and uh, took lots of precautions. Uh, the residents were very concerned about anything that might stir up the asbestos. Uh, there were air monitors there. Uh, the 
workers were in white suits uh, and they were going out there and testing. And as uh, was alluded to earlier, the residents were very distrustful of any public officials coming around their homes and uh, digging into the soil, looking at the mill. Uh, you know, because of the illness, because of uh, existing racism uh, and, you know, issues that were beyond just the asbestos mill, uh, people didn't want to have uh, anybody come and test their soil. And there was a lot of cajoling. There were public meetings. There were uh, community leaders were asked to intervene. Uh, I did a lot of coverage on our website, the davidsonnews.net website at that time, to try and explain what was going on. The town had a website devoted to it. And uh, eventually, most of the homeowners agreed to have their soil tested. After the first round in 2017, uh, more decided that they saw the cleanups happening at their neighbors' houses, and they decided to come back in 2021 and, and join that round of testing and cleanup. So uh, things did happen on, on the west side. The first round of cleanups cost about $3 million, several million dollars again in 2021. Uh, workers went house to house and uh, took core samples. You can see them uh, digging it up here. And uh, they took it off to be tested. And um, more than 100 were tested. Um, and um, I checked out one day. I went along with these guys to watch this and checked in regularly about what they were finding. Um, in all, the contractors removed and replaced soil at nearly 50 of those properties. They included homes, uh, churches, and even a town park that had built on had been built on top of an area where asbestos had been de deposited, really about a block from the mill. Uh, many residents were moved to hotels during the cleanups. And as they were doing these cleanups, this is what you saw. There was a crew there with uh, excavation equipment. Uh, workers in hazmat suits were there. There was air quality monitoring equipment. Uh, and as I say, in most cases, people were moved out of the area while this was happening. Uh, lots of efforts were made to make the people feel comfortable about what was going on and also to take precautions. Um, I covered all of this for WFAE, including um, strange scenes of workers in hazmat suits mowing people's lawns. Signs went up around the yards. You can see a line there where they're going to put the grass down. And this was not an uncommon sight. Davidson Presbyterian Church was, uh, the lawn was mowed. This was before they started the actual cleanup, but uh, imagine if somebody came to your house and said, I'm here to mow your lawn, and they're wearing a hazmat suit like that. And you've been thinking, okay, for all these years, I've been mowing this lawn myself. Uh, people were concerned about this. But uh, one thing that was different this time after the um, concerns were raised yet again by residents is that uh, the town and public officials did begin paying attention. Um, I spoke with resident Ruby Houston, and uh, this photo you can see clearly that she lives directly across the street from Asbestos Hill there, and the, um, that's downhill from the mill. I saw the concern on their faces. They acknowledged this is a problem. This is not good. Ruby was really just uh, capturing there what she saw as a huge change in the way things were happening in Davidson, that town officials were finally acknowledging something that the residents had known all along. So after years and millions of dollars of cleanups, contamination in the neighborhood, appears to be mostly a thing of the past. Uh, the state has discussed uh, designating the area as an asbestos watch zone. Uh, that would put future property owners and developers on notice about the history of asbestos there. There was some discussion about actually putting it into people's deeds. Um, and that was, uh, for whatever reason, it was deemed to be a little too harsh. But I think it's safe to say that uh, anybody who's coming into the area now uh, it would be very difficult for them to plead that they did not know about this, uh, as Robert Kenyon did in 1973. And uh, the asbestos watch zone, there's multiple uh, versions of this. This is one that was shown at a public meeting. The orange area um, would be recorded in town, and if somebody came to apply for a building permit, um, they would learn about it that way. So, you know, it's now pretty well known in that area that asbestos is a potential hazard. Uh, so whenever public works projects happen, like this Charlotte Waterline project that was happening uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the county, when they were, the, the water system, when they came in, they had to take extra precautions. They had to wear protective gear like this. They had to uh, do what you do whenever you're digging up something that has asbestos in it. They had to uh, 
um, bag it and put it into trucks and take it away. Um, officials knew that uh, asbestos had probably flowed down the hill onto the road in past years, um, you know, before there was any um, repaving going on there. It used to be just a, a dirt gravel road. Uh, so when they needed to dig it up, they had to follow all the protocols. And this is uh, on the road that's just below Asbestos Hill there. So there's still a problem of asbestos on the factory site. It's under a temporary cap right now. And by temporary cap, I mean both that uh, plastic and soil and grass that's over Mystery Hill uh, and also the other parts surrounding the mill. Uh, it's under the grass there. It's, some of it's been paved over for parking lots. Um, it is monitored regularly. They have to submit a report every year uh, showing that they've done testing and that they've checked out to make sure that there's no erosion and there's no exposed asbestos. Now town and state officials are eager to come up with a permanent solution for this, and they're hoping it will come as part of a redevelopment. Uh, the, the mill owner uh, did not have the money or desire or will to do anything about this. Uh, there's not really a, a program in place that would easily make anything happen there from the public standpoint. Uh, and I should say that the EPA took care of the, EPA Superfund took care of the asbestos in people's yards. But the Department of Environmental Quality for the state of North Carolina was responsible, is responsible for the mill site. So uh, can it happen with redevelopment? Well, in 2019, a new developer emerged. Uh, and this time it was somebody with experience in redeveloping what's called brownfields, areas that have been contaminated. And this new developer, Mark Miller, has gotten farther than anybody before him. I think there was at least six or seven developers before him who uh, tried to do this and got scared away by asbestos. But he had experience doing brownfields in Charlotte and uh, he was ready to tackle this one. So uh, he's reached a brownfields agreement with the state of North Carolina. And the Brownfields Agreement spells out how the property can be redeveloped, and it requires that any work on the site be subject to an asbestos plan that also must be approved. And anything that happens there must protect the neighborhood. It's most likely that the asbestos will be permanently capped, as Miller told me. And let's listen to what he had to say. You know, right now, the site is in a temporary state and it won't last forever. And so a developer or a, a group needs to come in and permanently encapsulate the site and take this liability off the table for the town and for the neighborhood. And public officials have long said the same thing. We really need this to be taken care of as part of a redevelopment. So last winter, um, after I did that interview with Miller that time, uh, his company actually bought the mill for just $50,000. Um, the cost of the cleanup really needs to be baked into uh, the, the purchase price there. It's not clear yet when it might be redeveloped. Um, that'll have a lot to do with the post-pandemic real estate market, according to the developer. And it also has to do with his development of an asbestos plan that meets the state's requirements. But at least there's now a plan for the first time. So one question is where the money might come from. The Davidson Town Board has said it will lobby for state and federal funding to help uh, with securing the asbestos. Um, it may come from partly from the business plan that's developed there. Uh, the mayor says it would mean a lot to have an opportunity to develop that site. Um, this is a, an architect's drawing of what the site might look like. Uh, they have promised they will not demolish the building, so they'll have to do a cleanup of what's there. Uh, they have promised they will not put housing in the building, which is something that neighborhoods raise questions about. Um, at this point, they're looking at the possibility of offices, shops, maybe a restaurant or a brewery, uh, just commercial space. Um, it would definitely mean a lot to the town if they could get this old mill turned into something that would be a draw rather than an eyesore. And there's another major element to Asbestos Town that I haven't gotten to, um, and that's the fears that always come with redevelopment. Uh, plant neighbors worry about gentrification, and it's already a fact of life in their community. And they are concerned that, um, um, you know, it's already, uh, there's already a constant stream of mail and telephone calls and text messages from people wanting to buy their homes. Davidson is one of the wealthiest communities in North Carolina, and apart from this mill, it's really uh, viewed as a very desirable place to live. And they're concerned that this could get worse if there's a popular development right at the edge of their neighborhood. 
For some, there's also still the worry about asbestos. Evelyn Carr lives a block from the factory and said this during a, a 2019 meeting about the redevelopment plan. I'm hoping that you don't do it because we have lost a lot of people. I lost my daddy, I lost my husband from asbestos. And if y'all go in there now and tear this asbestos up, I have lived in that asbestos for 90 years. I'm 90 years old. And I don't care what you do to it, you can't protect that asbestos. And those fears play on the old fears about asbestos and the, the lingering distrust about the way that the town has handled the asbestos problem. Uh, I also spoke to somebody named Rosalia Polanco. She was a student at Davidson College, graduated in 2018, and she says that the failure to deal with asbestos for so long is a clear case of environmental injustice. She studied the issue for a senior paper in her environmental studies major, and she had this to say to me. I still believe that it truly was an environmental injustice, specifically environmental racism. So environmental injustices are when certain communities are disproportionately being adversely affected by something in their environment. So in this case, that area of Davidson was historically predominantly African American. And with my 2010 census data, it still held true that um, most African American residents in the town of Davidson are still living in that area or very closely nearby. Um, and so they were for years, for decades, being directly exposed to the asbestos. So as I said in Asbestos Town documentary, the question is really whether residents of Davidson's west side will ever really feel like they're part of the conversation. So I spoke to a gentleman named Marvin Brandon. Uh, he's uh, involved with the Gethsemane Baptist Church on the west side of Davidson. Um, to him, the proposed mill project goes beyond worries about asbestos. It's about how it might spur gentrification. I just think that we have to be more cognizant of how it's affecting those who really can't afford to do anything different. This community will eventually be nothing but rich people, but eventually when there's no younger people that can afford to move back into Davidson, when there's the older people on the west side have passed away and their children don't reclaim their property, then somebody else is going to come in and, and tear down what they don't want and rebuild. And I just think it's, it's not good. In some ways, the legacy of, of asbestos has actually kept the mill from being redeveloped all these years, and it was a bit of a saving grace, if you can call it that. Uh, but it may have helped forestall gentrification on the west side, but probably not by much, and we're already seeing it. So it's a complicated story, and it's not over yet. Uh, the redevelopment of the mill may take another five years or so to, to work through everything. Uh, and I think uh, it's something that I will be continuing to watch. And a lot more people are watching it now. Um, they have gotten informed about it. I think one really interesting aspect of this was the number of people who approached me after Asbestos Town was published who said, I've lived here for so many years and I never knew about this. Uh, these are not things that we should leave buried. We should be talking about them and making change. And I just want to say one more thing about my sources. I could not have done this project without the help of the people on the west side of Davidson. Uh, I've lived in town for 29 years and I've gotten to know many of them through different projects and by covering events there, but it was really only because they trusted me that I was able to do the interviews that it took to really uncover this story and add some color to the history of this mill and the neighborhood. It even took them, uh, still took a lot of effort to convince some of them to be interviewed and to do it on tape. Uh, there's a lot of reluctance there. And I didn't get everybody I wanted, but I'm grateful to those who chose to do it. I'm also grateful to the public officials who took the time to talk with me, especially those at the EPA and the DEQ. Uh, in the midst of a period, uh, you know, going back a few years when EPA officials were not supposed to be talking to the media uh, because of edicts from Washington, D.C., uh, they did so anyway because they knew how important this was to the community. Uh, also, current and former town officials were very uh, instrumental. And the developer, who really strikes me as somebody who gets it, he is somebody who understands that what's there uh, is, is a tragedy and a horror and something that needs to be fixed. He thinks he might have a way to do it, and he, and he thinks he can do it in a way that will both make the community better and also work as a business proposition. So. 
Uh, it's a model for places elsewhere. And thank you so much. And I invite people to reach out to me. I put my information here on the screen. Uh, please go take a look at the webpage there and listen. I recommend, there are multiple pieces to it. I recommend listening to the full documentary, which is about an hour. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. Hello, everyone. And we have the pleasure of hearing now and receiving some audience and some answers from David Borax um, about his amazing investigative journalism. So um, I'm first going to start uh, with my own question for you, David. What is one lesson you learned from this type of, um, of this investigation in particular? That's a great question. I guess I would say that the problem of asbestos is hidden, and it's something that people really don't know about. They don't know to ask about it, uh, but it's there. And there are people who do know about it, but often they are the powerless, the lower income, people of color, uh, who are accustomed to people not listening to them and talking about their problems. Uh, in Davidson, in particular, uh, people in the African-American community on the west side that I described in the documentary um, had for many years been talking about this issue. And the town officials paid lip service to it. Oh, yeah, we'll do something. Or, you know, they, they basically put it off. Um, there was an incident, as I said, in 1984 where a mother complained and uh, they got some action at that time. They got a, a temporary cap on top of the asbestos, but as it quickly went out of, uh, out of sight, out of mind mm -hmm. again. And uh, I think the lesson here is that, uh, you know, we need to listen to these communities when they tell us that there's a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. A question from the audience. Yes, uh, I have a question for David. Uh, I was really moved by your, your presentation, um, especially for the cleanup of the city of Davidson in North Carolina. I have a question. Um, so we talked yesterday, you talked about the cleanup of the city of Davidson and the removal of former places that had asbestos, where it was dumped, where it was in the factories, and it cost about $3 million in cleanup, you said? Yeah, it was three million for the first cleanup in 2017, and probably a similar amount the, the 21 cleanup. So, I really like the pl the plan of that, and that's just one city in America. So, I, my question is, have you collaborated with other people to try to push for a plan to execute cleanups like this in cities all over the country? I have not uh, done any kind of advocacy work. I'm a journalist, and I follow where the story goes, but. I would say that anybody who you know catches wind of what happened in Davidson might look at it as a model, um, so that you know if the, if you hear about this problem, get somebody in. You know that the EPA was in charge of the cleanups at people's yards and in the parks and the churches that were affected in the West Side neighborhood, and uh, they came in with a you know a, like a lightning plan. The hardest part for the EPA was getting the residents to trust them enough to allow the testing on their property in the first place. And, but I would say that other communities that, that know that they have these kinds of problems should uh, you know, make sure that the authorities who are gonna do this, uh, whether it's their state environmental officials or the EPA, come in and they spent a lot of time uh, with community meetings, with education sessions, uh, with visiting individually with people. I mean, the people in Davidson got to know, uh, there was a, a woman named Wanda Miller from the EPA. They got to know her like she was a neighbor. She was there so often. And it takes a lot of grassroots organizing to make this happen. It's not something that you can just, we're gonna come in and test. You, you just can't do it that way, so. Excellent, thank Great you. Great question. Another question from the audience? Yeah, this is uh, Linda. And I have a question, David, for you. So what I've seen in my work is that many times communities don't want to acknowledge the fact that they have asbestos, they could ha be, you know, ha have a super fun site almost going on, and they diminish it because they don't want the residential stigma to impact their property values, et cetera. Did you see any pushback from the residents of Davidson to embrace the fact that there was asbestos contamination that they had to acknowledge and then work through? So uh, over the years, as uh, you know, I described how there was a change in the way the authorities approached things and they, they, there came a point 
in 2017, 2018, when they realized this is a problem that we need to deal with finally. And they called in the EPA and the State Department of Environmental Quality, and they were ready to do something. Um, so there was, I think, at that time, more of, of an acknowledgment that we need to do something. But one other place that I ran into this was um, I was doing my research, and uh, when I published, began airing the first elements of the series that led up to the documentary, um, and I, I gave this project the name Asbestos Town, and that was based on uh, my knowledge and, and things that I learned during my research that there were these places all around the country that were asbestos towns. And so I thought, I'm gonna call Davidson Asbestos Town. And there was a lot of pushback from people in town about that. Both on the west side, um, those people resented the idea that I was putting this asbestos label on their neighborhood. Um, they, they don't have anything to worry about as far as their property values go because Davidson is a very hot real estate market north of Charlotte and uh, houses sell as soon as they go on the market, if not before that. Um, so that's not really an issue. But I think people didn't like the label. Um, they felt that we we're more more than just an asbestos town. Um, and other people in other parts of the town and some of the town officials were a little leery of that label. But I felt like we need to put a, a label on this that makes a loud statement about this. We need to call our town what it is, which is an asbestos town. And it was. I felt like some of that pushback was an, another attempt to try and minimize what was going on here. And so I, I stand by the title. We had a community forum at the end of my project a couple of years ago, and somebody asked this question, and I said, I stand by it. I think we need to, to make people pay attention to these things. Is there another question from the audience? Well, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering, how did you approach reaching out to community members? You didn't know them. You know, what did you go, knock on doors? How did that work? Well, uh, as, I, as I say in the documentary, I, I've actually been covering this story since about 2008. And uh, so I, I am a member of the community, and I don't think I could have done this project if I had not been covering it regularly over many years and did not already have some contacts in the community. But I relied heavily on uh, some existing acquaintances and friendships that I had and introductions from people. You know, can you please, I really need to talk to so-and-so. I don't know them. Can you do an introduction? And it's like any kind of a, a project like this. You really have to, you can't just drop in and do it. You've got to work all of your connections. You've got to win the trust of people. And uh, you know, I really feel like that happened here, and it's given me a basis to continue covering this story. Linda. One more question came in, and it's about um, logging the data from Davidson to not only help Davidson, but learn from this man-made disaster. So has Davidson funded a registry or community outreach to educate the residents not only have early warning symptoms, but log anybody that has been diagnosed with a disease. We no. Can learn from you. No, there's no formal uh, attempt to catalog and register the people who've been affected by this. There's not even any agreement that anybody there has died of asbestos related mm -hmm. diseases. I mean, you can talk to the residents in, individually, and there are lots of stories in the families about my daddy worked at the mill and he got sick, you know. My brother worked at the mill, but there's no, nothing written down anywhere. And I feel like we don't even know how many people are affected. And I think it's a little bit different from some of the other asbestos towns around the country where we have numbers on it. You know, we have people have gone to clinics. They they have they've done X number of tests. There's no organized effort uh, to date that would actually track this in a way that would make sense. I did hear just last week about uh, a woman on the west side of Davidson who is trying to start doing this. And uh, I think it's something that needs to be supported. Um, I don't know that there's not any funding for it. It's something where she's just like basically starting out with a list. And I guess you got to start somewhere. But uh, I think a formal registry is the next thing for Davidson. Thank you. We can all learn from your great journalism, but also the tragedy in Davidson. Yeah, thanks so much. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank again David 
for um, his excellent investigative reporting. I always think that journalists go hand in hand with our whole efforts in public health. They play a really important role. And congratulations on um, being recognized by ADAO for the Andrew Schneider Memorial Lecture.